Very much welcome. Uh, happy to see you all here. And uh, we continue this uh, conference with a part that, uh, well, as an organizer of a conference, you have the opportunity to, to choose some of the subjects yourself. And I'm being <laughs> a little bit egoistic here because I have a problem with the thing, with the word of liberalism today. And I have that, that's why I've called this session and, and panel to help me to, to, to how to cope with the word liberalism today. Because uh, when I was young and joined the, the sort of free market movement and was advocating for capitalism and so on, I, I was, that was naturally a part of liberalism. But today I can't say that for me, when I talk, people, people call themselves liberals, they're not, that's not equal to, to be a pro free market or, or market liberalism. Market liberalism is not the same as liberalism today. And that, that's, that's my opinion. And I, that's why I'm calling myself liberal conservative or conservative liberal. But what is the current status of, of, of market liberalism within liberalism today? Is there a future for it? Is there actually a market for market liberalism within liberalism? Or is that a... Is that a, a uh, dead end road. So please help me, and I have got the distinguished um, panel to help me with this. We have uh, Professor Hannes Gisarsson from Iceland, who has studied liberalism from the very beginning, I think. And we have Dan Klein from George Mason University, who is an expert on, the, on this area. And we have Katarina Kerkinen from Timbro, who has just written a book about uh, how could liberals and conservative work better together and understand each other? Hope we can do that. Then we have uh, Katarina Bogdanova from Kristina Bogdanova from from Germany. She's a, uh, from a media company, but also but also a member of the Liberal Party in Germany. One of the parties, liberal parties, that's actually our. <laughs> yeah, free liberal, <laughs> exactly. And many country liberal parties are actually uh, smaller, smaller than, uh, than perhaps the liberal movement or and much smaller than people that are saying that they are within the market liberalism sector. So, so, so please, Hannes Gisarsson, where does the liberal movement start? When and where? Well, it's a pleasure to be here in Sweden. We Icelanders, we consider ourselves to be uh, the little bro of uh, the Swedes, and uh, we have always uh, looked upon them uh, as uh, some people that we can learn from. Uh, and uh, I'm passing out now a book of mine that was published last year, 24 Conservative Liberal Thinkers, in two volumes, and I hope you'll be able to take a look at it, and I would like to point out that it is actually available online free of charge. You just have to uh, download it there. Now, uh, when I was at Oxford, I uh, founded the Oxford uh, Hayek Society with uh, some friends of mine, and we invited Hayek uh, to come to Oxford. And uh, we took him to dinner. And uh, Hayek gave a little speech at the end of the dinner, where he said, it was very nice for me to know of young people uh, being interested in my ideas. But you have to uh, promise me one thing. You have to promise me not to become Hayekians, because I've noticed that the Keynesians are much worse than Keynes, <laughs> and the Marxists are much worse than Marx. So I don't want to become Hayekians. However, I must say that I haven't always fulfilled this promise, because for me, Hayek is actually the most profound uh, thinker of uh, what we could call the conservative liberal uh, tradition. Um, if we could uh, characterize the 20th century in any way, I think the first 25 years would be the years of Lenin, the second uh, would be of, uh, of Hitler, the third of Keynes, 1950 to 1975, but uh, the last uh, one uh, period would be one of Hayek. And why is that? It is, I think, because Hayek uh, poses an extremely interesting question in political philosophy. How is it that we can accomplish so much, very well described by Johann Norberg before, if we, each of us, as we all know, know so little? And Hayek's uh, answer is that uh, 
It is because we can utilize knowledge that we do not possess individually, but which is transmitted to us uh, both through prices in the free market and uh, through traditions which constitute uh, accumulated cultural capital. So what we have is we can draw upon, we can utilize collective reason, uh, not only our limited individual reason, but also collective reason. And his theory of spontaneous order uh, leads to both conservative and liberal conclusions, namely uh, support for the free market and respect for uh, traditions. Uh, and what Hayek does, because Hayek was not alone, is that he articulates, in my opinion, uh, what I define as the conservative liberal tradition. I wrote my uh, doctoral dissertation at Oxford on that and on how Hayek stood in that tradition. And this is a tradition that we can trace back even to the Middle Ages, to people like Snorri Sturluson of Iceland and to St. Thomas Aquinas of Italy. And uh, they are not, of course, liberals. Liberalism only became, uh, came into being after uh, their days, but uh, they had some uh, pre-liberal pre in, in insights, Snorri and Aquinas. Both of them uh, agreed that the kings were under the law, like their subjects. They didn't make the law, they were under the law. And uh, if the king would uh, violate the law, he could be deposed. Uh, everybody knows about, uh, every, every Swede has uh, read uh, the speech given to the king by a lawman where he says, if you continue to wage war against Norway, we are going to depose you and we are going to do the same thing to you as we did to the kings that uh, violated the uh, contract in the past, you, we are going to kill you. And the king, uh, he <coughs> became uh, much more pe peaceful after that. And uh, Snorri Sturluson in his... Uh, the uh, book uh, The Saga of Eil also uh, presents a, a very interesting, um, <coughs> interesting description of individuality. Uh, Jakob Burkhardt in his history of the Renaissance in Italy said that the first individuals uh, came about in Italy. But I think actually uh, Eil Skattegrinsson was even earlier than they. In being somebody with a, an inner life, inner Leben, and uh, uh, being defiant towards uh, kings and gods. That was uh, Eil. And Aquinas provided us with a very strong and plausible defense of private property rights and actually of the uh, government not interfering in moral, mor moral affairs. So I think there are several liberal things that uh, they, they, provided us, uh, they provided us with. And uh, I would also like to recall that the Salamanca School in Economics uh, is a school of Thomists, and that was a classical liberal school. It has been neglected in the north of Europe, just like the, the uh, Anglo-Saxons and the south of Europe people, they neglect our Nordic traditions, as I, will, um, as I will actually discuss a little bit later on. Well, the classical thinkers, uh, we all know who they were. John Locke uh, argued that we could appropriate uh, uh, property from the commons without violating other people's rights. <coughs> David Hume uh, explained how the theory of justice and private property rights came about as a response to both the scarcity of goods and scarcity of neighborly love. And Adam Smith uh, presented these two wonderful ideas that we could have uh, coordination without uh, uh, coercion and that the profit of one needn't be the loss of another. Uh, we are all familiar with that. But then... I think that what I would uh, define as conservative liberalism came into being as a response to the uh, bloody excesses of the French Revolution, uh, where Edmund Burke and Benjamin Constant and Alice de Tocqueville, they uh, criticized uh, the, the revolution. Because there are actually two successful revolutions and two failed revolutions. The successful revolutions were those of 1688 in England, and in 1776 in uh, America, because they were uh, revolutions that were made to preserve and extend ex uh, existing liberties. Whereas uh, the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution, they were made to reconstruct society, which will lead to disaster. And uh, Burke and Constant and Tocqueville, they provided explanations why the French Revolution uh, failed. And the explanations are there. I'm not going to waste time in reading it out here. And of course, uh, also, I deal with it at length in uh, my book. 
Uh, then we had in the uh, uh, 18th and 19th century uh, champions of free trade. And under Schietenius, that you see, see here, he actually published his uh, uh, book about uh, the, the national gain 11 years before uh, Adam Smith with the same insights. It was not as systematic as uh, the Wealth of Nations, but it was really a, a pioneering work. And it has been neglected uh, elsewhere. The uh, strong conservative liberal tradition in Sweden. And then we had Bastia, uh, who had actually also a great influence on Griebenstedt and uh, other uh, statesmen in the Nordic countries in the 19th century, when the Nordic countries liberalized a lot, both Denmark, Norway, and uh, Sweden. And we had Herbert Spencer and William Graham Sumner, uh, that I think are both an, a neglected uh, thinkers, very interesting, very forceful, strong uh, thinkers. Now, the Russian Revolution. We are in Café Landmann in Vienna in November 1918. And Max Weber is visiting and he is having coffee with uh, Joseph Schumpeter. And uh, Weber says that the uh, uh, Russian Revolution will lead to disaster and failure. Uh, Joseph Schumpeter says, but it will be an interesting experiment. And Weber says it will be an experiment uh, or a laboratory full of corpses. Well, and that happens in all laboratories, uh, Schumpeter says. And uh, Weber becomes very uh, angry and he storms out of the coffee house. And um, uh, Schumpeter, he uh, stays on and says, how can you behave like that in a coffee house? Uh, but really, uh, Weber uh, uh, realized that the Russian Revolution was even worse than the French Revolution. Uh, and it became not only uh, a laboratory full of corpses, but also uh, the abolition of the rule of law, as uh, uh, Hayek uh, pointed out in his Rotoservitum in 1944. Uh, here you can see a landowner and a priest, and they're being executed by a people's court. You will abolish the, ru uh, the rule of law in uh, socialism, because you have to, uh, the plan has to <coughs> be the main thing, not really the uh, rights of individuals to choose. Uh, then we have uh, in uh, the Nordic countries, uh, uh, Nordic conservative liberalism, and the reason I'm mentioning this here is that I'm working on an anthology of uh, Nordic uh, conservative liberal thought in English, and you see these guys here, Gustav Kassel and Elie Heckscher and Tryggve Hoff, and it has been very interesting to read their work because they actually, they're very, very original, independent thinkers. And... Uh, uh, Kassel, he anticipated Friedman's explanation of the Great Depression, uh, and uh, Heckscher, he anticipated Rawls' uh, uh, the <coughs> principles of justice, and uh, the Laffer curve was anticipated by both of them, and you can see uh, extremely interesting observations in their works, which most of them are only accessible in, in, in Swedish, but since we are an old Danish uh, colony, we learn Danish, and if we learn Danish, we can also read Swedish, so it's accessible to us, this thing. And Trico Hoff, that is the third man there, he was really an intellectual hero who um, fought for the same uh, principles as the other ones, uh, the principles of conservative liberalism, which can be uh, put uh, in three slogans, so to speak, uh, private property uh, and uh, free trade and limited government. Those three elements are the core elements of uh, conservative liberalism, in my opinion. Then we have uh, people who have sometimes been characterized as uh, conservatives, but are really conservative liberals, like Michael Oakeshott. And uh, what Oakeshott saw was that we in the West, in the th last thousands of years, with a very long tradition back, we slowly acquired the will and ability to make choices. And if you have such individuals, with the will and ability to make choices, then you have to tr have coordination between them. And you do that with uh, and independent rules, uh, <coughs> the Richtstaat. And um, uh, I think this is also reflected in the old contrast between Genossenschaft and Herrschaft in uh, German law. Otto von Gierke, he uh, pointed this out. Genossenschaft is, you know, when you're all... Uh, uh, <coughs> equals. Herrenschaft is when you have a direct order from above. And uh, <coughs> all of this shows that it is a, 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 an old tradition that has been slowly developed. Uh, 
and amplify it. Then I, uh, my book ends actually with Robert Nozick, who, uh, who, who, who presented uh, 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 justice as uh, distribution by choice. In which Chamberlain is popular, then he simply uh, uh, should be allowed to keep the money that is earned by being chosen by a lot of people. Uh, it's quite a, quite a simple thing. I had some conversations actually with Robert Nozick when he came to Oxford to some colloquia. Uh, and uh, he explained to me why it was that he wasn't as hardcore a libertarian as I had been uh, when he wrote Anarchy State and Utopia. And his explanation was very interesting. It had nothing to do with socialism, with redistributionism. It was more that he had begun to realize that the state could sometimes be the expression of our common identity, of our shared ideals. And that's, of course, what uh, conservatives uh, realize the state is. The state isn't only a monster that is trying to seize our money, although occasionally it changes into that, such an animal. It is also uh, something that uh, can be uh, loved if it is not a prison but a home. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, that's what Nozick said, and uh, the, one of the reasons he was brought up that way uh, was that he had become uh, a strong supporter of Israel, in fact, that's what he told me. Now, conservative liberalism uh, seeks or gets strong support from, from economics. E economics uh, explains to us the dynamic n nature of, 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 of the economy. Uh, Milton Friedman came to Iceland in 1984, and... Uh, uh, invited by me and uh, the Minister of Trade, he gave a luncheon for him and I stood uh, by the side of the Minister uh, and uh, Friedman and I introduced the guests to him. And you know that Friedman uh, did want to abolish uh, the Central Bank. So when the Governor of the Central Bank came there, I said to Friedman, Professor Friedman, here is somebody who would be become unemployed if your ideas would be implemented in Iceland. No, no, no. He would not get unemployed. He would just have to move to a more protective job. <laughs> this is precisely what capitalism is about. It's about moving us, not by commands, but by choice, into more and more productive jobs. This is the dynamic nature of capitalism. But the problem with some of our uh, economist friends is, of course, that uh, they know uh, what to have, but they do not know what we are what our aspirations are. They're good about efficiency, but not as much about identity. And um, some things in life are not a matter of choice. They are commitments, ties, loyalties. Uh, they are something that we have by virtue of who we are, like uh, the reason that we should love our uh, parents, uh, because they are our parents. We, uh, we didn't choose them. And civil society is just as uh, important as the free market, uh, family, property, and morality. So we have to, I believe, combine um, uh, cosmopolitanism and patriotism, and we have to make populism and nationalism servants of, but not threats to, uh, liberty. But I would end my, um, my short presentation here by recalling what my very good old friend, Sir Anthony Fissa, uh, always said, he was, uh, he was the man who has been founding all those uh, uh, free market uh, institutes all around the world, and he had a, sh a special toast. His toast was to, to, uh, to peace and low taxes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Hannes. Uh, we can take questions later on when all the panelists are ready. Now we go over to Dan Klein to see what's... It's liberalism, the last one there. Well, it's delightful to be here. Um, I come to you from the United States, and of course I'm accustomed to seeing liberal used in a way that I don't subscribe to, that I don't follow. Paul Krugman, Justin Trudeau, you know, all the people are liberal. So I, I, I've been concerned with this matter that concerns Anders uh, forever, and I very much favor standing up for the word liberal. Um, <clears throat> I think it's going to be confused and difficult 
words gather these different meanings. The left steals words and abuses words, and it's just going to keep happening. You've got to get used to that. And you can't let them just make you flap to their movements every generation or two generations. That's my basic attitude and message to you, is that there is a long history here that Hannes just talked about. And I would, you know, you could go back before Aquinas and talk about all of Christianity in the manner of Larry Seedentop and then the liberal emergence. And it was a one-time thing and it was called liberal when it got started. Well, early in the 1770s, as I'll show. And that's only, you know, this is a, our 500 years. And I think we've got to stand by it. Our own language is one thing we can control. So I'm going to say talk about language just as you did this morning in your very exciting presentation about capitalism. Now, some of you may know about Google's Ngram viewer. They've scanned millions and millions of books. And so now we can trace the usage of words. And the noun with the ism didn't come in English until about the 1820s, as you can see here. That's percentages of all words. And so it's very, very small, but you can see the trend from zero. And this is what generally happens with isms. Isms were more popular in the 19th century, and usually there's a concept before the ism, of course. And then the, the kind of an issue is, well, does liberalism therefore exist before the word is used? And I certainly think it does. Um, you might ask, why was it that this ism was called liberalism, okay? And I've got just one Swede on this picture, the great Eric Gustav Yeyer, who was certainly a conservative liberal. <clears throat> um, so here's this picture again, and you could ask the same thing about, say, conservatism. You would never say that it didn't exist before 1830. You had Edmund Burke that people call conservatism. You have Samuel Johnson there and so on. Abolitionism. Of course, there was abolitionism before, of slavery, that is, before 1830. So, of course, it can exist before that word. Of course, there was protectionism before the word protectionism. There was racism and sexism before those words came. So, liberalism came in the 1820s, but it existed beforehand. Many scholars have said, wrongly, that liberalism was something that came after the French Revolution that got started as a political idea after the French Revolution and was imported to Britain. These are some of the people who say that. And Hayek said otherwise. He said, I know a lot of people say that, but, he's wrong, but, but I think they're wrong. I see it's being used earlier in very important ways, signal, foundational ways, in people like Adam Smith, and with engrams, we can see that Hayek was right, as I'll show you. The kind of Smithian passage he's referring to is this one, where he kind of encapsulizes the central idea of Smithian liberalism, allowing every man to pursue his own interest, his own way, upon the liberal plan of equality, liberty, and justice. With passages like that, Smith and other Brits especially Scots at this time, christened the attaching of this new meaning to the word liberal. Of course, the word liberal did have an older history, but it was about being generous. It was also about the kind of virtues and character that free men showed. That was, those were not political meanings, but a first political meaning was attached... Oops. Why is it, okay in the 1770s. And there it is. The engrams show it. Now we know. This is it. Big data. And where there's so much BS about big data, that's because when the techniques get complicated and un, in, uh, impossible to understand. This is not statistics. This is just counting. This is the big data. This is the truth. So we now know these expressions with liberal as the adjective, liberal principles, liberal policy, liberal ideas, liberal system, liberal government, liberal plan, came around 1770 and exploded, got picked up on, and became, if you like, Gladstonian liberalism. <clears throat> so we know. That's, this is another way of discussing it, but I'll pass on that. 
I did go back and check before w William Robertson's 1769 start to this, and it's absent. There's a couple of things in Hume, but basically it's absent. So I just can confirm this in a number of ways. And so you can see that once the noun liberalism starts, the blue line there that goes way up, that soaks up those other expressions that had been used. But this, this shows you that it was going before that very clearly. And you could perhaps even extend it backward to people like Hume. Um, but anyway, you can show this in other ways, for example, in parliamentary debates where this political usage, Smithian liberalism, is being used. You can show it in this journal beginning in 1802, doing the same thing. You can also show with the different languages at the Google Engram viewer that the liberal expressions did come to these continental countries, but later, two decades later, Britain exported it to them. Smith and his friends, and Britain then, exported it to the continent. So it precedes the French Revolution. Those people are wrong. Hayek was right. Smithian liberalism generally presupposes a stable polity. And then it's about, OK, given that we have legislators, never mind how they got to become legislators. What's good legislation? What is good policy in our stable nation state? And he said liberalization. He said allowing every man to pursue his own interest his own way. There were exceptions, of course. And he, you know, but that's the kind of like the presumption you start with. That was Smithian liberalism. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to those larger constitutional issues, these guys were quite conservative, as Hannes was indicating. I do think that actually this conservatism <laughs> extends to Smith and Burke. So while I do think the French Revolution heightened the conservative element and made people more expressive about it, and like Burke, um, I do think you could actually say that Hume and Smith were conservative liberals as well. By the way, I don't want to spend time on this later period, but when the Liberal Party in Britain changes and liberalism starts to take on the Paul Krugman meaning, if you will, that starts after the 1880s from the changes in the Liberal Party in Britain. And people found the need to say new liberal and old liberal. And you see that right here in the engram. Like it's right there. There it is. That's when it happened. That's when the change happened. An additional meaning was tacked on to the word liberal. And people were like, which, what do you, which way do you mean the word? Oh, old liberal, new liberal. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I like conservative liberal, and that is basically my understanding of classical liberals, so I would kind of use those interchangeably. Left is really, the people say it comes from the French Revolution and all that, and perhaps like notionally it does, but left was not used until the 20th century, even in French, or maybe in the late 19th century in French. So I think left is a very apt term for the left. Of course, in the United States, a lot of people say progressive. But you guys don't say that here so much, right? So that's why I think that's kind of parochial of my American friends to say progressive rather than left. I think left is more general. Uh, I've written some about this. So my final pitch is here. So this is a Chiron from Fox News. And you know, sometimes they, sh they talk this way, where they use liberal to mean left. And I don't like that. And so the, the, the person who made this Chiron can, has a habit, obviously, of doing this. And he can stand pat and continue to call the left liberal. These are options such a person has. He can decide not to call leftists liberal. And he can go further and say, I am a liberal. Now, my big plea, I've done this in some articles and such, is only option B. I think it's important not to call the left liberal. Whether you call yourself a conservative or a, a classical liberal or a liberal, that, 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 that's important too. 
But I think it's very important not to relinquish this term to them because it is the gift that keeps on giving. Don't give that gift to them. We made this mistake at the beginning of the 20th century and it's, we're fighting back now and there are trends, although the, it's happening to you in Sweden, there are trends going the other way, which I'll indicate. <clears throat> But before I do that, let me say that regardless of what the trends are and what the future holds, I don't think we should flap to their movements. And that, like I said, our 500-year history is our 500-year history. And this liberal emergence out of Christendom, and then especially, well, from the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, we had a liberal era. And it was called that. I mean, liberalism was that uh, up through, say, Gladstone. And that's one history we're going to have with us for hundreds of years. And we've got to find our anchors in something like that. This is part of conservatism, in fact. And so regardless of what the trends are, I think we should stand by the word liberal. Now, something about the trends, just final slide here. Um, in fact, more and more non-leftists are not calling leftists liberal in the United States. I'm very happy to report. These are some examples. I think Ben Shapiro never calls the left liberal. I think Breitbart never calls the left liberal. National Review has moved a lot towards not calling the left liberal. George Will, very eminent person in the US, similarly. And so this is all representative of a trend that um, I'm happy to say is kind of going in the, kind of like finally after 100 years reconsidering what was given up and saying, wait, wait a second, these guys are not liberals. If they're not just illiberal, they're anti-liberal. Um, so I say, you know, stick with the word liberal. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much, Sam. So we go over to Catalina. Let's see if we can get the slides. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anders, for that introduction um, and your opening remarks. And thank you for the invitation to speak to this very, very qualified assembly uh, and uh, to listen to both of you professors. Um, I think um, that both uh, Professor Klein and uh, Gisarsson made interesting points about liberalism, what liberalism means, um, what should be recognized as its sort of core elements and what should not. Also, what ideas and features overlap in the liberal and conservative tradition and how we could, like, might be able to move forward in a sort of conservative, liberal, liberal, conservative direction. Um, I do agree with you, Anders, regarding your concern about the sort of status of market liberalism within liberalism. I have some concerns about liberalism as such. Um, I have always found it maybe uh, less inspiring trying... Um, like tying oneself down to one of these like broad traditions, ideologies, and uh, more in trying to combine them, um, maybe seeking answers in this sort of broad history of ideas that one might call conservative, liberal, um, or such. Um, I will not uh, try to uh, do as uh, detailed or historical presentations as um, uh, Dan Klein and Professor Gisarsson did, um, but to add anything, um, if possible, I wish to make a few more prosaic or simple remarks uh, regarding the status of liberalism in Northern Europe in general and in Sweden in uh, particular. I think a few things could be said that has bearing on this like broader discussion about liberalism and conservatism, different overlaps and combinations of the two. Uh, when I realized that we uh, were doing slides, I put together two. Uh, and uh, 
just wanted to do some marketing of uh, one of the things that we do at uh, Timbro uh, and the project uh, that I work with, uh, which is basically about following the development uh, in Sweden amongst the uh, youths and students within the parties um, and uh, doing a little bit of ideas development, especially when it comes to combining ideas within this sort of broad liberal and conservative tradition. Um, the last thing that we uh, did just a couple of weeks ago um, is we put together a few essays on liberalism and conservatism and how they might uh, be combined in different like overlaps but also differences, uh, possible synergies uh, between these two um, traditions. Um, these are two of the essays. Uh, and the reason why I show this as well is I think um, that it might um, be give a little bit of a background on um, these topics and uh, what has happened these past like 10 or 20 years in Northern Europe that might uh, be relevant for the discussion. Um, in Sweden, we've had at least for the past 10, 10 20 years, um, a lot of liberal and conservative cooperation. This is especially following that we've had a really strong social democratic party. So if one wants some kind of change uh, in a market economy oriented way, that's necessary. Uh, following uh, the, the entry into the parliament uh, of the Swedish Democrats, this changed. The former liberal broad sort of center-right conservative parties took different directions. Um, saw differently uh, on the sort of strategic um, ways to handle um, the new political landscape. And for the past years, we've had a discussion about um, liberalism um, and conservatism in a way that we've talked about these two uh, ideologies or um, sort of broad ideas movements that, that they couldn't be combined they draw in completely different directions. Uh, the reason why we're seeing the shift in the political landscape in Sweden goes back to the sort of core fundamentals, the core ideas of these um, two uh, ideologies. And the simple uh, case that we try to make is that is not true. Uh, that in fact, um, when I talk about this, I mean with liberalism, I as well um, mean sort of the core in liberalism, I would say, is the classical liberalism that starts with the ideas firstly described by John Locke, developed more closely defined by Adam Smith, and later on in the 1900s developed by thinkers like Friedrich Hayek. With conservatism, it's hard to say that it started with anything else than Edmund Burke's reflection um, on the revolutions in France, later developed into more of a social conservative um, direction, and then later again in the late 1900s in a more liberal conservative one. And during that time also developed by uh, thinkers like Michael Oakeshott that we heard about before, Russell Kirk, Roger Scruton. And um, our case in these uh, essays and in the work that um, I've been doing at Timber is simply, well, these two traditions overlap um, much more than uh, maybe... Um, is represented in the sort of um, public debate uh, in Sweden. If you look at just uh, the, the ten principles of Russell Kirk that we have translated for the first time to Swedish, uh, when he tried to like sum up the principles uh, during these past hundreds of years that conservatives always seem to be able to agree on, I think there's a lot of synergies towards liberalism. Um, the case for uh, freedom and property, um, the need of separation and powers, uh, the view of both the sort of individual and the groups that she chooses to be a part of, uh, having an importance um, for that individual. Um, so that's what we're trying to do with that essay. And the case that I make um, in mine is simply that there is a lot of overlaps and possible synergies within liberalism and conservatism. The differences and difficulties I believe, are exaggerated. Um, the view of the individual, uh, the, which the, the conservative critique would be um, 
that liberals only focus on the individual, do not realize that she needs to be part of social groups or that she has loyalties to those groups or the nation or other things, uh, would be such an uh, exaggerated point. Um, having an optimistic or pessimistic outlook on humankind, I would say, is another. Where I would say there's in the sort of broad liberal tradition, there's much more of a dualistic view uh, on uh, humanity and, uh, and individuals than, um, than what it usually sounds like in the sort of um, critique against liberalism. The view of the nation would be another one that I think is probably the one that has caused most stir these past 10, 20 years, um, where I would say in the sort of broad liberal um, history, there is uh, so many different ways to view the nation, its legitimacy, its borders, its uh, relation to the individual. Uh, Immanuel Kant is uh, one that is often um, put up in the sort of uh, common debate, uh, has been a little bit in the debate in Sweden, but I would say that uh, Gottfried Heder would uh, just as much uh, be an inspiration for liberals today. Um, so that are some of the sort of um, differences that I think uh, are exaggerated um, in the common debate. And at the same time as this sort of um, debate has been going on in Sweden, I think sometime after 1989, basically, um, the political landscape in Northern Europe, but in the West at whole, um, shifted. Um, I personally think that the sort of narrative about the end of history has been a little bit exaggerated afterwards. Uh, someone who... Um, did more <laughs> back in 1989 than I did. Uh, you can uh, correct me on this, but I believe when you go back and look at sort of the common debate, how these, um, how what's happened around 1989 has been described, and what uh, what you looked forward to, how you saw the development to come back then, was not as naive as some. Um, in some in academia and the public debate wants to make it today. But I still do think that in some aspects um, we were so busy in seeing uh, what happened and the big sort of um, conflict um, between the two societal systems that we did not see um, aspects of uh, culture, questions about national identity, security, borders, within and around societies. At the same time um, that 1989 happened, they started to become more important and we were bound to meet it at some point. And at the same time, um, after the wall fell, um, I think the development was... Liberalism was made to be more of a maximalistic idea, not only to be about the, the core of John Locke and Adam Smith, market economy, individual rights, separations of powers, limited government, but were made to be um, an idea um, that was about uh, so much more uh, and a sort of um, um, different personal qualities, uh, a way to look at life and society. In Sweden, uh, as well, this past 10, 20 years, I think liberalism has become associated with uh, a lot of the sort of big policy mistakes uh, that has been made. They have not only been described as something that has been done by liberal uh, politicians or something that's associated with these ideas, but something that is every single one of them has been described as uh, necessities following uh, liberal core values, uh, if you think about uh, migration, integration policy. Um, so evidently uh, what we are seeing is a little bit of a backlash um, towards liberalism. And um, the, the big question um, I would say that has been asked in the sort of uh, public debate is does this mean the end of um, limited government, market economy, separations of power? Is this um, what we see the decline in, and my case is um, probably not. 
Um, I would say liberalism is in decline uh, in somewhat, in some aspects. Um, maybe especially as um, a sort of brand. <laughs> I think uh, it is uh, less attractive today um, to sort of um, call yourself a uh, liberal and to try to um, like find inspiration in that uh, movement and brand. Uh, we do see a conservative increase in Sweden. Uh, when the uh, opinion analysis and um, uh, political scientist Peter Santesson um, met this, he d described uh, an interesting thing in a book called Liberalismens idéer from uh, Axon Jonsson. Uh, he noted that just the past five years, uh, this was 2020, we have seen a conservative increase uh, in terms of people defining themselves as conservative from 11 to 22 uh, percent. Bear in mind, this is the country that are like uh, highest up on world value service. So conservative, not, not that many people have called themselves conservative in the past in Sweden. And now it's an increase to every fifth Swede calling themselves conservative. But when he look at this group, because this is basically liberals that have shifted into calling themselves conservatives. So what are, what are the sort of opinions that they uh, bear following um, this self-identification. Well, if you ask them about individual rights, market economy, separations of power, limited government, they are more liberal than the liberals. <laughs> they still uh, hold these values very strongly. But obviously, um, calling yourself what has um, been in so much in the public debate connected to some of the biggest uh, policy difficulties regarding questions of culture, national identity, the different spheres in society, your different loyalties, um, of course that becomes less attractive. Um, so I do think whilst liberalism might be in decline um, in this part of Europe, market liberalism is not. Um, the values around market liberalism, um, the view on market liberalism is still quite strong. Um, I think the sort of, uh, if we are to learn anything from these past 30 years of uh, uh, the political landscape shifting and the focus shifting into uh, different questions that we might not have been used to following um, 1989, it would be that, and it might sound like a paradox, but liberalism turned to <coughs> maximalistic. It should find back its core, talk more about market economy, individual rights, separations of power, how wealth and prosperity, prosperity is created, and at the same time um, be generous towards other political movements, conservatism in particular, and to um, try to see and understand that the sort of other questions that people are asking, the sort of other answers that you are seeking uh, concerning all kinds of different questions in what it means to live in a society together, it might be better to find inspiration elsewhere and to be humble in sort of trying to combine our core values with other ideas. Um, so that's, uh, I think, my conclusion would be, uh, I do think that people that still call themselves liberal, at least in this part of Europe, has strong values uh, concerning market liberalism, would you only view that group? You would probably think that the sort of um, um, attraction of market economy uh, would be in decline. But if you look at the total political landscape, uh, the picture is a little bit different. And I think uh, it's, um, the picture is mostly uh, a concern for optimism. Thank you. Yes. Have no slides. Yes. Uh, it could be. You have no slides. No. Yeah. And no, I don't have a slide. Yeah, no, 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 I'm. No, no, I don't no have a slide. No, no slides. you don't have to do anything. Yeah. Okay. I'll just post that one. Yes. Thank you very much to everyone. For me, it's a pleasure to speak today about liberalism. What is liberalism? Is a political and social uh, philosophy that promotes uh, individual rights, civil liberties. 
free enterprise and uh, democracy. Uh, we are we liberals are uh, open and willing to uh, accept and uh, respect behavior and opinion uh, different from our own. We are open for new ideas. Um, what uh, liberalism is based on the <laughs> principles of personal liberties, private properties, and limited uh, government intervention. Thank you. Okay. We, liberals, should be convinced that the best pol uh, po politic is to have few politics as uh, possible. Why? The most people gain freedom, increase the prosperity. So, basically, uh, liberalism believes that people shouldn't push other people around. Liberals also believe that we humans should naturally help other people and protect them whenever we can. Democracy is not just a majority a decision, but a program for discovering the win-win situation that it creates. Uh, eventually, socialism uh, achieved that um, as knowledgely high proportion of the national income was spent on taxes levied by the state. To this end, an ever-increasing proportion of private income was withheld through taxes. Our uh, private affairs are constantly being regulated and um, constantly being forced upon us by experts, more state intervention in wage negotiations and controlling the people and the residents, more armies and empires, aggressive aliens, increase national, nationalization of the means of um, production. The greatest challenges uh, have always been poverty and tyranny, which through uh, state violence prevent ordinary people from getting started. There are consequences from allowing, allowing or forbidding people to get started. Eliminating poverty through uh, economic growth as China and India are doing now set the um, state for true equality. And this is what we should do. We should have a true equality at the moment. Um, but one must also uh, grant the freedom for to do so. Negative developments are currently accelerating. The conservation of essential basic rights such as freedom of movements, economic freedom and freedom of state power um, will allow us into privileges and exp uh, expansion of state power, surveillance and control associated violation of privacy and personal poverty, um, sk skyrocketing regulation, and also um, monetary policy that uh, threatens citizens' savings. Uh, I should say also one quote from uh, Friedrich August von Hayek. He always uh, said, it's high time to think more about how we can get off the road to uh, Serbians and prevent freedom from becoming a foreign world for future generations. The general development of um, industrialized uh, countries is invariably in the direction of state growth, higher taxes and over-regulation obsessed with details. Techno pessimists has received uh, tremendous boats in today's zero risk society. For many, there is no question that new technologies will uh, inevitably herald the end of the world at the end of mankind. However, technologies as values neutral and in themselves neither good or bad. As with any tool, you can use them for both good or bad. The internet and the social media, for example, can, can be hijacked and monitored by dictators in order to spy on their own citizens or used by the population 
to organize resistance against the arbitrations of the political class. Techno pessimists can count on a powerful ally, the state of its coercive um, apparatus. When new technologies are developed, appeals from worries to pollutions are as safe as amen in church. It should ideally forbid the unknown altogether. So regulations are also an increasingly uh, popular variant of technology implements. States should monitor social media algorithm, enact data protection regulation, and split up larger technology companies. Also, I would like to say that um, there are big changes due to the technology's advance that affect all of us. These opportunities must be used and not over-regulated. And this is what the liberal ideas stand for. We, um, for creative uh, entrepreneurships, for the opportunity by your money to improve your life and to be free. And this is what we want. We have to open our eyes and to, to look at our own uh, ideas and to fight for, for freedom. Thank you very much.